Hi, welcome. My name is Sven Hansen from the Resilience Institute. What I'd like to do here is just offer you a short, practical video on how we re-establish rhythm and flow. 2020 has been a challenging year. Many of us have been disrupted. And it's time to think about how you might re-establish a rhythm and rediscover flow that's going to work for you going forward. And remember, resilience is both an individual journey it's a responsibility for your life, but it's also something that is dependent on your environment. So as you work through this, remember those two themes. Choose the right place to be in your life and work on yourself. As they say, one for all and all for one. So we're going to take some quick looks at rhythm and flow. What is it? If you're going to achieve goals, you're going to have to bounce because sometimes you won't succeed. How do we bounce and recover? We're going to talk about tactical calm, how to be present in a situation, and how to plan for flow in every day of your life. So let's start with flow. Flow is the optimal performance state. This is where your mind is clear and silent. You're not tracking time. It's effortless, graceful, and it's rich. The days you achieve flow, or the days you go home and say, I love my job, I love what I do. And it's a great state, you know, you've got these theta rhythms and gamma rhythms binding your brain into a super fast, intuitive place. You're surging dopamine, nandamide, and endorphins. And that's why when you achieve flow, you can be five times more productive. If you're leading a team, you can double that productivity of if you're, leaving, if you're leading a team, you can double their productivity simply by increasing the amount of flow by 20%. All right, so flow is our goal. What many of us fail to remember, particularly in a year like this, is recovery is critical. If you want to do flow, you have to take time to recover, to bounce forward, to allow those muscle cells to regrow, the brain cells, the memories, the creative... Uh, reflection required. So recovery requires delta wave. Right? This is your deep sleep component. It involves serotonin and oxytocin, which is why good time with people, celebrating, getting yourself a massage are good ways to build recovery. And then we've got to reset our goals. Keep them really, really clear. These are your beta brain waves. And this is where we generate noradrenaline in the brain, adrenaline in the body, epinephrine or norepinephrine if we're in the US. All right, there's also if we overdo those goals, we can push cortisol, which is not so good. And many of us make this mistake. When you're going to step back into flow, it's not a matter of rising to the challenge. It's a matter of sinking or relaxing, being present for the challenge. Every time you step towards flow, you want to relax, exhale, slow your heart rate, achieve heart rate variability, activate that vagus nerve, because it's from a relaxed and present base that you can re-enter that flow state. For those of us who are a little bit more logical and rational, there are some key criteria that help us and our teams get into flow. And there they are, and you can take some time to read through those. I think for each of us, it's useful to ask the question, which are the key criteria that really matter for me? The clear goal, quick immediate feedback, which is why coaching is so important, and matching the right meaningful challenge to your set of skills and talent are the absolute non-negotiables. You've got to get those right. The others are a little bit more variable. Okay, so set yourself up by understanding what helps you slip into that flow state. And then the final piece to understand about flow is that it's not the only state. And I think this is a really important starting point. First thing, think about today or yesterday and try to get a sense of how did your day pan out? Did you get some flow? How much of the day was a sense of control? And you can see you can map this by understanding the challenge was it a high challenge, low challenge, and the skill. When skill and challenge meet, you're in flow. There is nothing wrong with control and relaxation. In fact, some great leadership 
and some great performances happen when you're relaxed and skillful. What's a little more worrying is over on your left where you see anxiety, worry and apathy. And for many of us, we wake up, the day is a panic. We rush from one thing to the next in a continual state of adrenaline, beta wave, anxiety. We're so exhausted at the end of a 12 hour day, we collapse in front of Netflix into apathy. Eventually we calm down enough to fall asleep and then you wake up at 2 a.m. to worry again. Not a great way to live. What's missing? The skill. So our job today is to understand how do we move ourselves along that skill axis towards a state where you can enjoy a day with flow, control, relaxation. Our suggestion, aim for about 30% flow. Roughly an hour and a half is a good target to have in your diary. Make sure your day included some control and make sure it includes some relaxation. If you can stretch for flow, sometimes you're not going to achieve it. So right there with flow is the need to accommodate adversity, to be able to absorb a loss, to know what's happening in yourself and to bounce forward fast. The first part of doing that is knowing what happens when we confront adversity. It usually begins with an overloaded mind, too much going on, which is very expensive. Remember we said in flow, the mind is silent. In overload, the mind is overactive, it's switching from task to task. This burns too much energy, so the body pulls the plug, the next second you disengage and you don't know it. All right, so disengaged is when I'm talking to you and you drift off and look at a text, or you start to daydream. Experts say that roughly 46% of our day is spent disengaged. What a waste of opportunity. Now, it's important to understand the brain rests, recovers, remembers, reflects, generates creativity when it rests. So we want to work in focused bursts with quick rests. The key here is to understand when you need to rest and to rest deliberately rather than it's sneaking up on you. And this happens to all of us. This is a study of judges, just to give you a sense, don't think of your brain like a computer. We cannot turn on and run 100% all day long. It's very variable. In the morning, most of us are good. We can get up to 70% uh, cognitive willpower, if you like. But through the day, it continues to drop. And this is why it's so important to manage things like your sleep, your relaxation, your posture, your emotions, your mental activity, your breaks, and even your nutrition. As you can imagine, one of the key leads here is blood glucose. As blood glucose drops, we lose attention. And that's why many of us reach for a quick sugar to try and boost that. But of course, it doesn't last. All right, then it gets interesting. All right, so I'm going to introduce a new idea to how resilience fails. And this is still an hypothesis. We're going to work through it, and I'd love you to, to take a look and welcome your feedback. The first thing that happens when we disengage our brain is now we've become reactive. We are beginning to rely not on these advanced functions of our prefrontal cortex, but on our more reptilian reactions. And the first one to be aware of is flight or fear. When we're overwhelmed, too overloaded, disengaging, not paying attention, doubt creeps in. And we start to think, where is the next threat? We start to generate fear in our bodies. We avoid situations. And this can lead to anxiety. All right, very important to understand this because right now in the world, anxiety is the leading mental illness. It involves the flight reaction where threat switches to fear. It activates your sympathetic nervous system and adrenaline or norepinephrine. Your blood pressure's up, your heart rate's up, blood's going to your legs, you feel anxiety and worry. It can progress to fear and panic. And it can lead in work and in life and relationships to avoidance, avoidance, evasion and deceit. And this is where some of our distress symptoms come from. That's one option. The second option, and it's very useful to work through which is the one you usually default to, is the fight reaction. This is anger. 
right? We feel violated. We want to attack. We become hostile and resentful. Once again, it's an activation of the sympathetic system and the adrenaline pathways. Blood pressure, heart rate up. Now it's up to the top of the body. We can feel frustration, outrage, we want to blame people, anger, rage, attack, revenge. We might even lash out. Usually things we regret desperately after the event. And again, it gives you a slightly different form of distress. A lot of inflammation, heart problems, muscle problems will come from fight. And the final one is freeze. Freeze is the collapse response. So just as a reptile can play dead, as humans we can withdraw and immobilize. We submit to the situation. We feel tired and this can progress to sadness. All right? It's a dangerous reaction to play dead as a human. For the snake, it's a reasonable evasion technique. For the mouse, in the cat's jaw, also a reasonable evasion technique. For us, it drops the blood pressure and the blood flow to the brain. So it's very threatening. It involves the old vagus nerve, we'll talk about that shortly, and it's linked to fatigue, submission, exhaustion, sadness. We can slump, we might burst into tears, or even, imagine you cut yourself badly, you faint. If we don't address to this, it can lead towards depression. When you drop out of flow, when you hit adversity, which way do you go? Remember, it starts with overload. We disengage our human advanced thinking functions and we resort to our more reptilian reactions. To know whether you're a flight, a fight or a freeze person is very helpful. And if you can understand these and make sense of these, you can learn to beat them. And that's the idea of bounce. There are absolutely no question at the bottom. We have to connect and get help. Be humble. It is not a good place to be at the bottom. If you don't address it, that is where the risk of depression becomes a real issue. You need to understand what's going on and you need the human connection of a counsellor, friendship, a doctor you trust. In fight, we want to slow down. We want to show some respect and seek to understand where someone is coming from. Right? It is mitigating that anger response with a, hang on, let me check this. And in fight, we need to learn to relax, to sleep well, to recover, rejuvenate the body, slow your breathing. And we'll talk about these practically. To be disengaged, we've got to periodize our day. That means you work hard and fast in short and focused bursts. And after that, you step away, you take a break. Get in the sunshine, have a glass of water, a cup of coffee, whatever you need to do to give your brain time to rejuvenate. And remember, be very, very careful of overload. That is, if you like, the deadly sin of our time. There is just simply too much. So simplify. Every day, be clear about what you're going to do doesn't mean you can't have fun, but be clear about what matters. Keep it simple, keep it concise. Let's move to tactical calm, all right? The first practical skill, all right? Two key parts to tactical calm. This is the way you get from flow into the recovery phase. It is also how you get from the clear goals back into flow through that presence and relaxation. And some good science here is just useful maybe to think about. So the vagus nerve is the longest nerve in your body. It's called the 10th cranial nerve. It runs down both sides of the neck, through the chest, around the heart and the lungs, down through the diaphragm and into the gut. The old vagus is what causes the freeze reaction. So when we void our bowels and bladder, we collapse, we burst into tears, we faint. That is the old vagus activating. But as humans, we have the capacity to train the new parts of the vagus nerve. Mammals have this too, but humans have an awful lot of it. By taking time to practice tactical calm, you teach your body to myelinate that vagus nerve, which means you get a stronger flow from what's called the ventral vagus nerve, down through the body, it slows your heart, slows your breathing, drops your blood pressure, and allows the brain to recover, to re-engage, and to pay attention to others. Fundamental practice. So simple, so badly used today. Watch your breathing. 
be aware that as we get activated, we tend to take a deep breath. And you notice my chest expands, my neck works, I breathe through my mouth. This is not a good alternative if you want to be effective. The answer is to relax your diaphragm. When the diaphragm relaxes, it basically pushes the air out of your lungs. When you exhale, perhaps with a slight pause, that's when the new vagus activates. Your heart rate slows, your blood pressure drops, you're releasing nitric oxide, your brain and your emotions are coming back on stream. All right, very important to understand. It's not so much belly breathing as it is middle of the body breathing. So your lower ribs and your upper belly, you want them to kind of bucket handle and expand out. That's the inhale. And to exhale slowly and smoothly again through the nose. All right, there are lots of ways to do it. If you simply were to do that breathing for five minutes a day, you would start to accumulate a more myelinated vagus nerve. If you can accumulate up to eight minutes, you get long progressive changes improves your level of inflammation, improves your health, improves memory, sleep, thinking, and emotional control. All right, this is the base of any contemplative or meditative practice. To sit upright, slow your breathing, slow your heart rate, and keep your mind and your emotions positive and steady. But you can also do it by splashing cold water in your face. And in fact, one of the really exciting ones is cold water swimming, which releases a, 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 a protein that actually protects you from Alzheimer's. So as we see more and more people swimming in cold oceans and rivers and lakes, this is what they're doing. It's a strong stimulant to the vagus nerve. Any massage will do it. Gargling, fasting, laughter, singing, face-to-face um, -face connection, time with people you love. And sunshine is also good for that vagus nerve. All right, so the takeout here, tactical calm is a way of training your vagal break. It's really concrete. It's really simple. You want to lengthen your spine. Standing light and long or sitting nice and light and long. You inhale gently just to ground yourself through the nose. Never take a deep breath. And you breathe out through the nose, long and slow. Roughly five or six seconds. Pause and gently in. I think ideally a good place to start is three seconds in through the nose and five seconds out. If you're comfortable, see if you can increase that to four seconds in and six seconds out. Remember that breathing is low, the neck is relaxed, the chest is relaxed, the face is relaxed. Give yourself the opportunity to bring to mind something positive, a beautiful day, a beautiful occasion, a beautiful person. All right? It helps to stimulate vagal tone. You can do this very fast. Our all bracks practice doing this as they run into a difficult situation. They do it in terms of red, blue, decide, do. So you choose, am I going to go flying into this without thinking, or do I pause, calm myself, exhale, and step into the situation with skill. That is tactical calm. Quite a powerful idea. So our most primitive response is freeze, then fight, then flight. If you're desperate, you may want to activate them. But very rarely do these reactions work. Tactical calm is laying a calm base. It is when we are calm and present that we can begin to trust. When we trust, we feel safe. This is the key function of the vagus nerve. When I don't feel safe, that vagus nerve shuts off and I retreat into flight, fight, or freeze. So if we can establish calm in our lives, in our communities, in our businesses, we can establish trust. And when we trust, then we're curious, we're interested, we care, we want to play, we want to engage, we want to do things together. All right? So trust gives us the opportunity to work together, to collaborate skillfully, which as we know today is the foundation of performance. Let's just ground it. Okay, so remember, tactical calm after flow is how we move rapidly into recovery and bounce. Once we've set our goals, we want to relax and be present to the challenge. 
to stimulate those alpha waves, trigger the vagus nerve, release nitric oxide. Now, this cycle is pretty intense. So one of the things that is really, really important to do is understand your daily rhythm. Each of us will have perhaps three or four critical things that you need every day. These little practices change your life. There are things like stretching when you wake up in the morning. There are things like taking your exercise, perhaps that swim we talked about. It's about working in rhythms, periodizing. In, do it, focus, pay attention, finish a job, back off, walk away, rest and recover. And you'll notice flow is, is diarized. Every day, you want to have a period of flow in your diary. Right? Making quick transitions between tasks and then being really disciplined about sleep. And just very quickly on sleep, because we've I dealt with this in many areas. Remember, this is a, is a critical, non-negotiable when it comes to flow. You need to sleep enough the length. You need to sleep at the right time and with the right quality. So in very quick terms, this is an investigation for you. You need to understand what you need, what your body needs, what your emotions need, what your mind needs. Most humans need between seven and eight hours. The experts suggest that when we sleep less than seven hours, we're paying penalties, long-term destructive penalties. When you get your seven to eight hours, you are waking up a better version of yourself in every way, the muscles, the brain cells, your immune system, your hormones. All right, so you need to satisfy that sleep need, which means you need to be a little bit disciplined. If I, for example, need seven hours, 22 minutes, I need to know what time I need to be ready to sleep, in bed, relaxed, and reading a book. And I also need to know what time I can wake up. And that leads to timing. We all have a circadian clock. It's run primarily by the blue light of dawn and the suprachiasmatic nucleus. But we know that every cell in your body has a clock. And unfortunately, the only way you can control it is by managing this light. Big Zeitgebers, blue light in the morning, wakes us up, makes us warm, active, alert. Brilliant human beings. In the evening, you want to be darker, cooler, more yellow, and quieter. Because that's when our temperature needs to drop. So the more we can align our day with the natural cycle of the sun, the more we can synchronize our circadian rhythm. And this means knowing whether you're a lark or an owl. An owl has a longer cycle, 25 hours, and an owl might have a shorter cycle, closer to 24 hours. Two key bits here. Make your wake up time consistent. Wake up before the dawn. Wake up to see blue light, get at least 20 minutes of blue light into your brain. That will reset the clock most effectively. Second piece, know your cool down routine. Know what you need to be able to drop your body temperature, to switch off the LED lights and the screens, and to create more yellow light as you settle into the evening, to avoid your devices, to read a book, to go for a walk with a dog, perhaps have some time with loved ones. All right, these are good ways to cool down and drop into quality. All sleep requires these cycles. The deep sleep cycles, roughly 25% of your night will be in the first part of the night. You get shallow sleep in between, and then as you move into the next part of the night, you get more dreaming or rapid eye movement sleep. You want that cycle bulletproof. The more prepared you are for sleep, the more quickly you will drop into deep sleep. And remember that only happens once every 24 hours. Don't waste it. On the couch. Prepare for bed, drop into deep sleep. The faster your body temperature cools, the more quickly and the more deeply you go into deep sleep. Deep sleep is the reset. Cleans out the brain, replaces muscle, brain cells. Hugely important to lay the foundations for dreaming sleep, which is where memory, creativity, emotion regulation and emotional intelligence come from. All right, and for many of us, if we move those times that we talked about, we can compress the dreaming sleep. You're losing your creativity. You're using, losing your mental and emotional resilience. All right, so get enough sleep, get at the right time, and get the right quality. 
The next step is to master our emotions. Really key in the component of presence. There are situations like we described with freeze, flight and fight where a trigger delivers an instant reptilian reaction. They have strong emotions. Freeze is sadness. Fight is anger. And flight is fear. And when we react from these triggers, there is almost always regret. So the basic step is actually very, very simple. As humans, we are blessed to have two ways to regulate emotions. The first part is around those vagus nerve nuclei, the amygdala, the hypothalamus, what we used to call the middle brain or limbic system. These are fast, robust, freeze, flight, fight type of reactions. No thinking involved. If we lead our life emotionally reactive, we will live with regret. We will destroy relationships and destroy opportunities one situation at a time. The key here is to be conscious. What we call to name it. If you can say to yourself, I feel disappointed. The prefrontal cortex wakes up, the reptilian brain shuts down, and now you have choice. So step one with emotion, name it. That means you need to start studying yourself and asking the question, what am I feeling? Particularly in the case of fear, anger, and sadness. If you can name it, now you can breathe out. Now you can pause. Now you can take a moment. Absolutely essential. So you name it, allows us to tame it. And once you can tame that reactive situation, now you can choose. And that's what we call reframe it. So for example, if you want to take advantage of positive psychology, there are a few very, very simple messages. When I feel anger, seek respect and kindness. When I feel fear, seek calm and curiosity. When I feel sadness, seek appreciation, learning, gratitude, even a measure of joy. When you feel craving, seek contentment and gratitude. And when you feel fatigue and overwhelm, find your passion, all right? Get your body back into it, re-energize your system. All right, in a nutshell, that's termed emotional combat. Name it, moving it up into our human prefrontal cortex, tame it, giving us choice to respond skillfully, and then reframe it so that we can actually capitalize on that situation. It really is a life changer. And then part of the presence has naturally got to be the brain. And we want to be sensible with this brain. It is a complex thing with perhaps 50 to 70,000 thoughts per day. Often, if you look at them, they're not all that useful. So it's a first step is to separate yourself from your thoughts. When it's two o'clock in the morning and your mind is just spinning, it's a very destructive place to be. You are your thoughts. You really have trouble separating yourself. Step one, step out and say, what am I thinking? To notice them, to make your thoughts an object of your attention. In other words, you're naming them, aren't you? Once you name a thought, then you can start to work out what sort of thought. And that's step two. If we rush into the future, we dredge up mostly anxiety. If we tame it and reframe it, we can look at the future with hope. So when we look perhaps at carbon levels, it can immediately trigger a worry, which is a future negative thought. And I worry about what's going to happen to my kids. And I worry about how, where we're going to live. And I worry about my house. And I worry about my insurance. This is a very destructive place to be. All right? It doesn't add any value. There are times when you can go into the future with an upbeat attitude. All right, this is a big challenge. But the world knows about it. There are many things, there are many things we can do to solve this problem. That's hope. It is future positive. 
as leaders, it's really essential to keep your language future positive. We can also notice some thoughts go into the past. In the past, you have two options. One way is what we call personalized adversity. So I think, gosh, Sven, I can't believe you did this. You're such a failure. Here we go again. The story of my life. I'm such an idiot. I'll never get this right. That is depressed or sad rumination. Thinking about the past, drawing up the cud, chewing it, swallowing it, and back up it comes. The second form of rumination is when we don't personalize, but we project and blame, and we get angry. It's her fault. She shouldn't have. What's going on here? And now we're ruminating with anger. Both are past negative, unhelpful. Past positive means we look back an event and we say, okay, that's interesting. I wasn't very comfortable, but I learned something. Or you know what? That was a fantastic day. Well, I really appreciate what, what he or she did. Here we are being past positive, And this, again, is critical for our leadership, for our parenting, and for the chatter in your head. The goal, as much as possible, is to bring your thinking into the present, into the here, into the now. When you are 100% present, suffering dissolves. You are fully engaged. You're in flow. It's also what's happening in your brain when you're in deep sleep. It's what's happening when you're in a contemplative practice. All right? Step one, step away from your thoughts. Turn them into an object. Step two, locate your thoughts. Future, past. Positive, negative. Three, bring your attention into the present. And when you're fully in the present, then you can plan. You've got time. You've mitigated those emotions, you've done your breathing, your vagus nerve is activated, your empathy portal is open. Now we can think clearly. What do I do about this? All right, really important. Most of us have very little control over our brains. So it may just be best just to bring yourself into the present in a positive emotional state. As we get more skillful, we have to practice different. So, for example, someone comes at me very angrily. I know exactly what to do to calm, to be accepting of this, to respect this person, and to think, okay, how do I respond? Instead of rising to the challenge, perhaps I say, you know what, I can see how upset you are. I'm sorry if I was part of that. But you know what? You and I have solved much more difficult problems. Let's work out how you and I can solve this problem together. That is situation agility. All right, so you can work on your brain. Start with noticing. Take take time to strengthen that capacity to be present, in the flow, focused. Complement your focus when you take your breaks. Just thinking, how's my day going? What else is going on that I need to pay attention to? And then you can start to think how you use your mind in the way it should be used, which is to influence situations to the positive. All right, final idea. As you work into resilience, remember, it is one for all and all for one. And this brings in the vital capacity for empathy. It is surprising that after 50 years of research, there are still so many of us who don't believe empathy can be learned. Max Planck Institute, University of Wisconsin-Madison, that's Richard Davidson's work, have shown conclusively that if we exercise empathy, it grows. It's important to understand there's a range. There are some of us who are just mean. All right, we like to upset people. We hide well from authority, but when we're dominant, we pray on others. This is clearly part of life and society needs controls for that. Many of us begin this journey ignorant. We just haven't thought about our emotions. We don't want to think about our emotions. Please don't ask me about my emotions. We choose to shut the empathy portal. As we grow empathy, we've got to pay attention. The first way we do that is to pay attention physically. Be there with your body. Be open to people. Don't shut yourself down. Don't move away. Don't fiddle with your phone. Be present shoulder to shoulder, eye to eye. Show that person you're physically present. Physical empathy. Second, we need to develop the skills of watching the face, 
listening to the tone of voice, watching posture, and thinking through how's this other person feeling? What emotions are driving what I'm witnessing? This is emotional empathy. Cognitive empathy is the ability to put yourself in the shoes of the other person and to think, I wonder what they might be thinking. Each of those three parts of empathy happen in three different parts of the brain. Each one can be trained. We want to do more and more of this. And just remember to distinguish between empathy, which is the understanding, and sympathy, which is, if you like, caving into another person because you're feeling upset that they're upset. So remember that emotions are contagious. So when the child cries, I feel very uncomfortable. All I want is for that discomfort to go away. And the quickest way to get rid of my discomfort is to give the child a lolly. Well, who am I serving? I'm, I'm actually trying to mitigate my own empathic distress or sympathy. Whereas my job should be to be calm to be caring of the child and to think about that child's long-term well-being. Will the lolly help the child? I don't think so. Right? Perhaps there's another way I can be both understanding and skillful. And that leads to, to kind of a, you know, and everything, step in, pay attention, be present. to read those non-verbal cues, the tone of voice, the facial expressions, and search for the thoughts where you can get to know people in their whole lives. All right, if you're a leader, it's a whole new set of skills. Many of us have grown up as professionals where we're good at medicine or law or engineering or whatever it might be. And then we become a leader or we become a parent and we don't actually have the skills. So when we think about meeting the challenges of business, of family, of leadership, we've got to think about a new set of skills. Self-care, understanding your rhythm and flow cycle, being present for the challenging situations, the empathy, and the ability to influence skillfully. All right, so rhythm and flow is understanding how to set up your day, to choose times where you want to be super productive, super effective, to ensure you follow this up with an adequate recovery and bounce cycle, to set clear goals again, and then to learn to relax and be present in flow. Good luck. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you for your time.